Hello folks, welcome to the Trey and Harry podcast once more. Uh, we, we're looking at uh, how one lives with trauma. People call it post-traumatic stress disorder, which tends to be connected to the, uh, the forces, but it can affect other people who haven't actually been in the forces. Uh, people who've been sexually abused or they've been in difficult marriages and things like that. There's a lot of things, car crashes, yeah. many things that can trigger off trauma. It's, it's something that, that the humankind tends to uh, experience in all kinds of different ways. But when you've had it for a long, long time, it does tend to leave a, a, a scar. So we're going to look at Trey's trauma, which we've done on previous podcasts. Yes, it is. But we would said on, on one of the earlier ones that we would actually look at specific areas uh, that would affect trauma quite badly. Yeah? Yes. And we looked at uh, how living every day and experiencing external stimuli such as uh, uh, attrition from other people that causes anxiety um, and the kind of anxiety you have no real control over and it goes on for quite a while and it triggers off the trauma. So we're going to look at how Trey deals with that, she's going to give some examples because at the moment she's uh, going through quite a difficult time and that's triggered off the trauma. And then we're going to look at the kinds of things that she does that perhaps can help you as listeners, if you've experienced that as well, uh, of how you can, can deal with that and overcome that and push on and get by. So, Trey, over to you. Yes, um, when you have difficulties coming at you that aren't in your control, you have to deal with them. Um, I find with my trauma, it, it triggers it quite badly and my anxiety, my fight or flight, my... You know, it, it's, am I sensitive anyway about what's going on around me? And it just heightens, sometimes to the point where I'm very, very jumpy and nervous. Um, something as simple, say, as having a hospital appointment coming up and knowing it's coming and know I have to deal with it. And on that journey, I know on that day I will be a bag of nerves until I get there. Deal with what's coming at me and get away from it. It's, it's almost like I'm hypersensitive and hyper alert and it, I can't stop that. So in that time warp, as I'll call it, where you're stuck, um, you mentioned about the natural reaction to stress yeah. and that's the fight or flight, but then there's also that, that, that subliminal reaction from the trauma, the, the earlier historical trauma, yeah. that also trickles off. Yes. Yeah. So if you're in that particular situation where both have gone off, and that's not a good place to be, uh, you talked about um, an appointment at the hospital, which yeah. you got anxious about, but what about when things are going on that you can't deal with? Uh, that makes it even worse in some ways, because if, if I'm dealing with things where, say, somebody else is causing a problem or is bringing in the situation up or is causing say an atmosphere or doing things that affect my environment and there's nothing I can do to change that. I'm stuck in this real discomfort, emotional discomfort. I get migraine headaches, I can feel sick um, and I can't settle. It's, I'm agitated. Um, and it's very hard to get any kind of mental focus. So is it fair to say then that the earlier trauma, which has clearly left a scar, yeah. um, you know, we're not being bleak about this because we talked earlier, you know, this is, this is not us going, oh God, you know, I'm really afraid of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this is looking at this objectively and, and try to look for pointers that, that can assist other people that are listening, but also have assisted you. So that earlier trauma that you couldn't escape from, Yes. Yeah, and then you, in the present day, have external stimuli created by other people that put you in a situation you also cannot escape from. That's a difficult position to be in, isn't it? Yes, very. So you talked about going to hospital. Once you've been in the hospital, you get the anxiety over, you get the appointment, you carry it out, you come home. Yeah, but with the other stuff that you can't close off, Right, that fight or flight keeps on going. Yes, it does. It exacerbates the existing trauma and you end up stuck in this time warp. Yes, you do. Now, that's the place I want to take you back to. Mm -hmm. 
because that's the place that really a lot of people in living everyday lives with trauma end up in because it's almost like they're isolated from society when this is going on. Yes, yes, you do get very isolated. So you're living your life, you go to the shop, you go to your appointments, you know, you do what you do, you lift weights, etc, etc, but you're still in that time warp. Now you go for therapy, you've been for therapy, yes, you've had CBT, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of that's been, been useful for you, but it still doesn't take you out of that time warp. It so let's talk about that time warp. Yeah, uh, I mean, actually the CBT as well highlights that a little bit more. It highlights the fact of just how bad it is. Because until I started doing the CBT, I didn't realise how bad it was. You know, not really. Um, you just don't realise how bad you feel and what it's like in that, in, uh, in that situation where you're stuck in a mindset, an emotional mindset. Uh, that's kind of scary in some ways, but at the same time, being more aware of it made me realise, well, wait a minute here, uh, this is happening, and this is why I feel such and such a way, and I need to be more aware, how can I kick myself out of that a little bit, or alleviate it, or do something, whereas before, I was, li I was just living in it. So I hadn't even thought of ways to get out of it, because I didn't realise it was that bad. I don't think you always do. No, I agree. For that awareness, and that is partially uh, the the reason why therapy is is useful. Yes. It's not the panacea for all the problems with trauma, but it is useful to to make the person aware of what it is that they're actually living with. The problem is, once you become aware of it, it opens the door. Yes, it does. And all the existing problems that you probably kept to one side and trapped for a long time because it was too hard to deal with suddenly start to sneak out of the door, yeah? And as they're sneaking out of the door, and there's other things coming at you from the outside, things you can't close off, tell me what that feels like when you're stuck in that time warp. Um, tell me the emotions you feel. Oh, oh all gamut, really. Uh, anger is the biggest one. Uh, real anger at the injustice of what I'm having to deal with and why it is that way, and why I can't change it, because I have not got control over that. Um, and that's difficult because it's a kind of anger that you just want to break things. I mean, I've actually, it's almost like my whole body is tense and wants to just explode. And, and I've seen me at times just standing in a space thinking, I just, I just need to to do something about this, and I, I could I see it in my head I could break things I could just smash up the room just to get that release. So just what to stops get, you doing that? It's self control. It, it's pulling back from that rage because I know that won't help. It might break, and it's expensive <laughs> breaking all that stuff. Um, so it's very, it's a very strange place to be, and it. So if I decided to cut across you there, just while I'm thinking about this now. So, the the autonomic system, the system that uh, is is in there, that that tries to keep you safe, the fight or flight we talked about. So you either run away from what it mm. is that you, you're just coming at you. Oh, you um, it. Yeah. Now, if you're telling me that 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 you don't want to lose control. But that's also part of the, the, the system telling you to get away from what it is that's bothering you. Surely that's a, that's a, um, a, a juxtaposition, basically. You kind of, on the one hand, you know what you've got to do, but mm -hmm. then you stop yourself from doing it, which actually surely would cause more problems for you. It does, because I can't, I can't run away from it either. I can't fight it, and I can't run away from it. I can't move away from the situation, and I can't fight the situation, so I'm stuck in this... It's almost like my body is fired up and I can't do anything about that. And it, it, my stomach starts to go, you know, I, I get this kick in my, my gut and then it starts to, it almost turns like acid and it, and it hurts, it physically hurts. The headache starts, I feel nauseous because of my stomach and then sometimes it sets off the colitis because there's nowhere for it to go. It's stuck inside. Um, and that can, it can take me quite a while for that to come down because my hands start to shake, I feel jittery. It takes 
a long time for for that to wear off. So obviously that's detrimental to, to you and, yeah. and, and you know biologically as well as uh, mentally it's it's not good for you uh, and I'm not uh, promoting uh, violence or, or you know kicking things and breaking things. If we look at release mm. and the body when it gets like that it needs to release. Yeah it does. So obviously you get cortisol, you get a lot of acid, you know adrenaline because you're kind of fired up to get away yeah. from something. Surely something has to be done at that point. If you go back in history where you were, you were injured enough for quite a long time and yeah. you had no control over it, and you're now an adult where you have control over it, tell me what you think you should do. Well, when I was younger um, and it was overwhelming like that, I would quite often have to go somewhere and cry it out. If that makes sense, it was almost like I had to some kind of release because I couldn't do anything else, um, and that that didn't make me feel any, it made me feel a little bit better. But then I felt exhausted because it wasn't just like a little bit of a cry; it was a, a real awful wrecking, hacking, sobbing stuff, and I used to be physically exhausted from that. Um, and that wasn't nice either. So. So. Now. <laughs> now I try and do it slightly different. Right. Th there is no panacea for. No. For that in any way, shape, or form, and there's no way you're going to avoid those feelings. That's that's pretty much mm. how it is. I mean, you know, it might be that, especially for say a soldier who's been on the front line and that they've been in, involved with shooting, you know, the gun battles or whatever, and there's bonfire night. You know, and they hear the fireworks going off, it triggers it off again. You, you know, you can't ban bonfire now because, because of that. But if you can't deal with something that's triggering that off, obviously, in the world of counselling, you would resolve what it is that's coming at you that's causing the anxiety mm -hmm. and then move on. Which you can't always do. But you do. can't do that. No. Which is part of why, why we're doing the, uh, the podcast. So, we're in this situation where there isn't a resolution at the moment, there will be a resolution, yeah? Mm -hmm. But up until then, you're still left with those feelings. Yeah. Now, what we try to do is raise awareness for other people as well. So talk to me a little bit about each day and how you deal with it to try to ease those feelings, those emotions, especially the anger. Let's look at the anger. Yeah. What do you do to, to, to reduce those feelings of anger so it's not detrimental to you? Sometimes I try and do something physical and if I feel physically strong enough I would maybe do yoga or do a small weight workout or I use my stripe bag just for even if just for five minutes or ten minutes just to release something, some of that energy that, that that's built up. What about the anger? That helps a little bit, actually. It's a movement, it's it's the action, it's moving, it's doing something physical. That helps ease that anger. Because it's almost like a physical trapment. It, 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 your body's feeling strange, so by moving, it's, it's kind of working some of that out. I do that. So would you promote things like boxing and... and yes, yeah. I mean, the yeah. stripe bag that I have in my own space is a lightweight one. Oh, your sausage, as it was sausage, yeah. as, as it has been <laughs> somebody said to me once. <laughs> but it, even though it's light, it's still a movement, it's still a bit of focus, and it's still me... I'm, I can move fast around it. So that movement um, is releasing some of that energy. So could you say then... Um, if you look at the fight or flight system, that that in some way is actually fleeing from if the problem. You're, yeah, you're running away from the from the anger that's built. By the up. movement. Yeah, that, it's that I always found movement quite good for me. If I, uh, even prior to doing the box and the work and the weightlifting, I used to go for a walk. I used to have to get out away from what I couldn't sort with these feelings and just walk. And I think you've said before how fast I walk. Part of that yeah. is that energy, is that trying to yeah. get it out? If you, um, I've mentioned not necessarily uh, to do with trauma, but it just highlights what you're saying. 
most people who struggle with anxiety and, and the release of it, they can't uh, get rid of it. Uh, they tend to do things quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, people you'll see that are walking very quickly or they're very animated. Quite often, the, the, the underneath there is, is anxiety. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Mark was an example. Yes. You know, he had quite severe anxiety. He used to pace up and down. Yeah. A lot of people with mental health problems, they do a lot of pace up and yeah. down as well. Um, so, but just going back to that fleeing, as I call it, it was my uh, and the anger. Um, obviously, one would say the striker bag is actually facing the, the problem, but it isn't because the problem's somewhere no, else. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's just like a bit of a release, really, because otherwise it's sitting inside you and it's, it's almost like eat you up. That's not good physically, is it? It's not good. No, no, no. The prolonged anger, prolonged anxiety is not good for the, for the system in no. any way, shape or form. And you know that yourself anyway. Yeah. So if we're looking at that and people are listening when the podcast obviously when it's out, because they can't listen to it at the moment. <laughs> um, what would you advise them in relation to that? Because we touched on this, I think, on the second one, about the kinds of activities you took part in yes. that helped with it. But we're talking now at an acute level, mm. because this has been going on and took you to, a, I would say, a darker place. Yeah. Sort of the average kind of getting by trauma days. These, these are different trauma days, aren't they? Yeah, they are. You know, it's a more heightened state of anxiety which yeah. then evokes the old trauma along with the fight or flight. Yeah. So we are at an acute level and people listening now will also get to points where if they lose a loved one or you know, if they lose a job or something, something nasty happens, it's going to hit them harder. So what would you promote, what would you tell them? Well, it, Based on what you know now. Yeah, I, I think you would I'd find some way to release that in a safe way and exercise. I think for me, is because you're moving, it's a safe way to do that. Um, especially if you can do something in your own space. So it's it, it's it's there, you can go to it to release that. Um, and once you've had a little bit of release, I tend to find focusing the mind afterwards, even if it's a good book, to sit down and get lost in a good book because it, it, it quietens things down, because with the anger, I find, is all the chatter, because that, that comes in right on the back of it. It's almost like you, your bodies want to go, fight or run away, and then this other stuff comes. So as soon as you can re get that release, then the chatter's coming in, and you think, oh, and then you've got to deal with that. So it, it, it's it then, right, I need to shut this up because that's coming right, you know, it's the second wave. It's almost like it comes in waves, and this is the back end of that, the, the next item you're getting. Um, and it's quietening that down. And I always try and find, as, as soon as I can release that, and I build up that, that pressure cooker feeling, I find something to focus on, and if I don't do that, that's when I can go down because I've, I haven't been able to find a way to sidestep the second wave of that. And I suppose I can imagine somebody who's dealing like soldiers that must be like that, because they've got to have that release first from the phys physical stuff, but then the mind can kick in. So they've got to find a way to focus away from it. Yeah, well, I was going to come on to the, the what I call the pit. Yeah. Um, and depression is, you know, a, a big one in, in trauma as well as the anxiety. So you kind of go on to one end and then to the other and you kind of get trapped between the two. I know in the book that uh, I got that you read uh, with, not Ollie, the other one. Um, what was it, Ollie? No, it wasn't Ollie. That's the one I haven't read yet. What was the other one, the other chap? That Foxy. Asked? Yeah, yeah, Foxy. Uh, he, he, there was one section where he was going for a walk in the woods the first time with, uh, with the counsellor and he, he, he was in an alien environment and she was talking about the trees and uh, the birds singing all the rest and he, he just couldn't see anything. Yeah. He was just there. Now, that pit that I talked about where you have to at some point climb out and some people sadly uh, don't, it's quite common in people with trauma. You, you mentioned earlier there about uh, you'd reached a really kind of dark place and you went to a, a really low place. Yeah. Now, that's the bit for me that's crucial in relation to the tools that you actually acquired to climb out of that pit. Yeah. So that's what I want to take you to now because that's what I think people will be interested in. 
you know, we've talked about uh, what, what, what sledges are that, things are you control. You know, we, we've talked about things that you do to try to, to, to help yourself with that. But let's, let's go to that place where it's almost futile and you can't see any way of getting out of that pit. What do you do? What did you do? When, I'm in, when I've been in a dark place like that, I find it's just one day at a time. Sometimes it's just one part of a day at a time because you can't say beyond that. You can't say beyond the day and you can't say beyond sometimes the morning or the afternoon or the night. So it's just finding ways, little ways to, to cope with each part of that day. So tell me the feelings in the pit. For me... Let's, let's, let's look at more recently because obviously historically that's gone. Yeah. I'm talking about fairly kind of recent times where you've been in a dark, angry, low place. Yeah. And you didn't know how to get out of it, where to go, what to do. What were the feelings at that time? For me, it affects me in a way that I feel like I'm in a dark, I am in a dark pit. And I feel like I can, I'm sitting and there's walls of black above us are all around me and I can't see beyond the black wall. And it surrounds me and I can't see beyond it. And it feels like if I look up, there's a, the light is miles away and I can't get to it. And, and I'm in this place and I'm, it's almost like I'm going further and further down in that place. That's the only way I can explain it, really. Um, despair, no hope, what's the point? Which is quite common. Yeah. Now, the next bit is, when you're feeling that, and you have felt it recently, mm. right? talk me through the first steps you take to, to try to get out of that pit. Fear gets me out of there, because fear and then anger, but it's a different kind of anger. Fear, because fear gets, it, it can be all-consuming, because once I feel like that, I feel very frightened, because I know that if you leave yourself in that place, then you can lose everything, really. Um, and that's because I've seen it happen with my family, a family member. Um, and that fear kind of starts to kick in. Um, right, okay, I'm in a bad place. And when you're in a bad place, you can do things or make a choice that's not good, you know. And I don't know how many people have, say, taken their own life when they're in that, that bad place at a bad time because they couldn't see a way out. You know, that's, that's how bad it can get. And because I know this family member of mine has gone that way, and I felt that in that place, I felt that feeling. And that's a really scary thing. And so the fear kicks in first for me. It's like, oh, wait a minute here. I, I, I'm in a bad place and this could, I could make a really bad decision here because of the, if I give up and then on the back of that that's when my anger comes in but it's not that all it's more of a constructive anger it's more of right get find your way out of this because if you don't some you you could do something really awful here to yourself so you've got to get out of this and do it now so I start to look for ways out I'll, I, I look at, at possible solutions and possible ways that could change the situations. It doesn't necessarily mean I can do it, but it's almost like you, you, you build a scenario where you might, it might happen this way instead. It's, 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 it's a strange way of explaining it. It's almost like I see this bad situation, right, okay, can't cope with this, but what if that happened? Oh, wait a minute, that, that would change it this way. And then, that would change it this, oh, and then I could see. And I could, it's almost like I feel myself lifting out of that pit. So your first tool, obviously for yourself, but also for people 
listening and, and it, it isn't easy to get out of the pit or even begin to think in the pit because yeah. it's it's um and you mentioned about suicide yeah and there's many people uh, a lot of servicemen that have taken their own lives because they couldn't cope with it and yeah. that's that's really really sad some have been lucky enough to find that first tool that controlled anger i think uh, foxy talked about it in his yeah. book as well you know that 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 sheer will to, to survive because they knew they were actually going under yeah. now uh, that's not saying someone that took the life of were weaker no it's, it's just, a scary place to get to isn't it yeah it's just it's contextual it's it's you know circumstantial it, it just could happen to anybody at any particular time but the first tool you talked about was controlled anger yeah now that's not anger at yourself or, or, or the situation so much it's finding something inside of that will to, to, to push out of the same as if you're getting trapped somewhere, yeah. you try to fight your way out. Now, would you advocate that very controlled kind of fight, that anger, just to begin with? Would you say it's a good tool to start with? I think it's the only tool to start with because it's, it's, you can't always mentally focus on anything else that can refocus you, like an activity. It's the only tool I think you can start with because physically and mentally you can't do much of anything else. So it's having that fight, right, okay, this is, and I think by recognising this is a dangerous place to be, helps you. I mean a dangerous place, so you have really need to find the fight to get out of it. So we'll give you a scenario and we're going to round this off shortly because I'm very aware that you're going at quarter two, aren't you? Well, thereabouts anyway. Um, if I give a scenario, someone's living in an abusive relationship mm. and they've been in the abusive relationship for quite a long time and it's really got rid of all their self-esteem, self-belief, self-worth and they're just trying to get through each day the best they can. Now, that person, someone said, oh, why don't you leave them, you know, get out, go and do this or whatever and they can't. It's not easy. No, because they're trapped and it, it is... It's the old soundbite, oh, why don't you leave them then? That's the old soundbite if you mention it to somebody about getting knocked about or whatever. So that person, uh, you know, the other half's out at work or whatever and they're at home and they've taken to the bed, as they do each time, because they can't see any, any way forward. And they're on that bed or on the chair watching some mundane thing like Loose Women or something like that. And there's no hope for them. Yeah. How would you implement that constructive anger? If you had to advise someone to implement that, they're trapped, yeah, they've lost all kind of belief, willing, you know, the will to do anything. How would you use that tool, that first tool? Well, you... I've been there. So um, how I did it was I would sit and I wouldn't have the television on, I wouldn't have music on. I just sat with the scenario in my head because that's where I am. That's what I'm facing, this is how I'm feeling. I'm in this dark place, I can't see a way out. I can't see how it's going to get better. Right. I just don't know how I'm going to get through this. Right, so that person's either in their armchair or they're in the bedroom in mm -hmm. the dark with the curtain shut yeah. and the telephone uh, unplugged. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what you're saying is that they have to face that problem, look at it, yeah. however difficult it is, say, right, okay, what am I going to do about this? I would, what I, yeah, what I do, and even if it's just a scenario, even if he can't actually do it, think about how it could be done. And that's how I've got through. Right, this is how it is. However, what if it could be like this? And I, I know you could say, oh, you're just kidding yourself. But it's a visual way of seeing a way out to alleviate what you, the burden and the weight of it. And that's what you're doing. You, 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 you're convincing your mind in a way to see your way out. So in some ways, and, and I mean, I would advocate this because it's, it's one of the most powerful ones. It's yeah. a form of empowerment. It's taking that control back. What you're actually doing with yourself, you're giving yourself some respite. Yes. You're, actually, you're actually seeing a bit of light that wasn't there before. Yeah. Now, it may well not, not happen at that time, and you know, the scenario you think of might not necessarily take place, but it gives you respite from that, that, that dark cloak that's over you that you can't actually see your way out of. 
and it actually gives you that little bit of respite to then dust yourself down and maybe look at something you can do that's constructive. Well, one of the things I used to do, and it'll sound a wee bit odd, and I did it when I was a kid. If something had happened, or many things have happened where you were in a dangerous situation or you were faced with real aggression and abuse, I would play that situation out again in my head, my way. Not the way it went, my way, where I was in control. And now, that, and now I know that sounds really strange, no, I know it's in your head, it. it's in your head. So say for instance somebody attacked you, or somebody was shouting at you and being aggressive and you were frightened and you couldn't deal with it and then you're left with that. And I would then think, right, okay, this is what happened, but now I'm going to turn that round, I'm going to be, right, that came at me and I reacted this way instead, I said that instead and this is what happened instead. So it ended differently. So almost like you take that scenario and you twist it a little bit. So how would that fit in with uh, your favourite um, style of counselling then, which is cognitive behavioural Youth therapy? therapy. It, it, it's similar to that. Um, it is similar to that. I think the, the difference is, the difference for me is it's, this isn't real because that's not how it happened and um, I, I don't, actually I used fantastical things to change that. Um, I like to read fantasy and, uh, and horror and stuff and a bit of sci-fi so I would bring some of those elements into that because for me the situation was too much so I have to be different I have to bring a bit of difference into that to kick me out of such and such. And I know that might seem like a strange thing, but it's the only way to get you out of that pit. You're in a bad place, you're in a really, really bad place. If I don't find a way to get myself out of that, I'm going to stay there and it's going to be so much worse. So I will, um, say for instance, I would, um, I remember when I watched, say, The Matrix, I decided that I'd work, uh, learn Kung Fu in five minutes and I could do that. In my head, I could do that, and that's how I dealt with such and such. It's not real, but it was a way of seeing it differently. It was a way of feeling stronger. Does that make sense? It does. So we're, we're, we're looking at another tool in your box, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, it's a way of making yourself feel stronger. You give yourself the those attributes, those beliefs that you are stronger. And that's... That's how I would so say. you say it's an aspiration then? Yes, it is. Because um, you've got to find strength some, somehow inside yourself. You've got to give yourself that belief that you can do something. Even if it's just in your head. But that's what you do. So you can't change the person, the person who's causing no. the problem. But you can change the way you deal with the problem. Yes. And two of those things are, one is constructive anger, and the other one is digging deep to find that strength. Yes. And the strength would lead you to where? It leads you to being able to lift the weight of where you are, because it's like a really heavy load on you. And once it's a bit lighter, you can see ways where you can actually do things that are better for you. I mean, you can do positive things for you then. So even if you can't deal with the situation, you can do things for yourself that make you feel better. Like I went to study, I studied, and I, I got into I learned subjects that I enjoyed or helped me at work, and I felt better about myself for that. But to get myself into a mindset to do that, I had to do this other prayer. So we're in the pit, yeah, the pit we talked about earlier, yeah. and there uh, are two tools which will help you to get out of that pit. And we look at the pit as the place that you're in at that time. Yeah. But all around you outside that pit is still the same problem. Yeah. But you've managed to get yourself out of the deeper part of that pit. And then you've enabled yourself to actually start to fight back. And I use the, the, the terms fight yeah. uh, back. Because that's what it basically is. It's, 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 it's a, a battle. Yes, it is. Between two people. One is the... the um, 
the instigator of the problem and you're the victim yeah. in it. So what we talk about here is now we're, we're looking at uh, constructive anger yeah. that will give you that kind of fight to start to climb out of that pit. Yeah. Then through what you mentioned earlier there about looking at different scenarios, you develop that strength to actually climb out of the, the pit. Yeah. Now we're at the top of the pit. Yeah. What do you do next? You do things that are positive for you, that you feel good about yourself. It'll be, it could be anything to do with a hobby that you enjoy and, and taking that forward and improving skills in some way, exercise, improving your skills that way, feeling better about you physically. Anything that makes you feel better about you. So is that the third tool? Yes. Right, so we're on the edge of the pit yeah and we've found some of those things and then the instigator of the problems comes into the fray once more how do you stop yourself falling back in that pit you don't always do you fall back in the pit but you know you've got the skills to get yourself back out of it it's like a, a continuous loop so it's pretty much adaptive and you're trying to to uh, to build a bit like somebody's who's build not building but, but uh, create a tunnel to escape from somewhere yeah yeah is that Yes. Is yeah. that kind of, yeah? Yeah. So, you, you know, you go so far, but then you're going to go back again. Yeah. And then you go back to it again. Yes, but I tend to find, though, the more you do it, the stronger you get. You don't stay down as long because you know you can get yourself out. You've been there before and you've been there before. And the more times you're there in some ways, the stronger you know. It gets a wee bit easier. You know exactly what you need to do to get yourself out. Yeah, so let's look at this again. Okay, we, we, we're back in the pit. Anybody who's listening, you know, this, this is our uh, term for uh, for being quite depressed and down and anxious, etc., with that black cloud over you. Um, you're in there, and now I'm going to set a trend now, right, okay, you're in there. Let's talk through how you get out until eventually you do free yourself. So talk me through using those tools that we've talked about. You're in the pit. Yeah. What's the first thing you do? Well, the first thing, you, you're aware of your emotions. And once the fear kicks in, the anger, the constructive anger needs to come in, right, OK, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to get annoyed. You're, you're angry about the fact you feel like this. I'm going to get out of this Yeah, you've now. put with this long enough. Yeah. I've got to the point of, no, you know, it pushed me too far. Um, then you visualise how it could be. And you visualise how you can be stronger till you feel that strength and you feel the the weight you know ease and then when you get to you can function better you do things that make you feel better both emotionally and physically and give you that feel confident about yourself more confident about yourself so those tools you mentioned there yeah yeah they could be used slightly different by each person oh yeah um and uh, the the eventual escape, I was the one that used the t tunnel analogy, didn't I? Um, the, the eventual escape, you have to keep that hope that that's going to happen, don't yes, you? Yes, you do. You know, because you can't always carry anger, you can't always find the strength. But once you start to do it, that self-belief starts to grow, that confidence starts to grow, that you will at some point escape. Yes. Now, many hostages have talked about this. Yeah, it's keeping they that They do hope. similar things. Yeah. Um, taking control of the mind and create scenarios and look at the future you know when there was no future you can create a future yeah you do yeah. I've done that for many 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 times I've created a future I, I hope for right this is what it could be like yeah and I mean when I mentioned pit before it could be the bed it could be the sofa you know you, that might be the place you go to when you're in that, that, that pit um, it doesn't matter it's a dark place yeah. you know people can sit on a park bench when there's people around them and can still be in that pit, you know, they can't connect and, and Foxy talked about that. Yeah. You can be in nature where it's beautiful but you're still stuck in that yeah, pit. Yeah, you don't see it now. But you know, I mean, that, that, that uh, anybody who wants to, to, to check that out because uh, Foxy's the one that was on the Celebrity SES, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, Not Celebrity SES, it was just SES, wasn't it? Yeah. Who Dares Wins? Yes. Yeah. And he wrote a really good book about his time after war and during war as well where he actually talks about that, that pit, yes, that place is. where he couldn't get out and he didn't think he'd ever ever get out. And he contemplated taking his own life as well, yes, did, yeah. which you touched on earlier there. Mm. 
uh, and, and you know don't feel weak if that is a feeling that you're feeling because it's quite natural to feel that way when, when there's no hope and you've reached a point where you just can't see any way out then that's what tends to kind of happen people yeah. think about that some people sadly do go ahead with that and then they never come back again that, that's the end but you know we're talking about uh, what you can do and if you check that book out that's also good as well Trey's got one coming out eventually <laughs> um, because we're trying to to see the severity of this and we're also trying to see the the the, the positive aspects where you can come out the other side and uh, probably stronger you're not going to move away from it completely but you can actually get to a better place and that's the thing the mess we've always got to to to, to send out to people haven't we yes definitely. you know because trey has been back to a number of pits over the past few years uh, because of what's been going on and still is going on but she's always managed to climb out of that pit and push on into safer ground, haven't you? Yes, and, and, and it, that's what I do to do that. Um, the visualisation is really useful for me because sometimes that's all you've got. You know, you're in your own head, that's, that's all you've got. So you use your mind to help you instead of it going against you. So it's, it's part of that, I've mentioned it before, the dichotomy between two yeah, parts yeah. of yourself. And um, it's which one... Is stronger, and and it the one that's better for you is the one you're fighting for, the one you want want to be stronger to get you out of that dark place. If I said to you that that hope on its own is not enough, what would you say? Um, hope is a good thing, but you've got to have somebody to back it up, and that's why I think constructive anger comes into that because it, you know it, you sometimes the injustice of what you're dealing with. Constructive anger is good. Because if you if you let it get on top of you, then it breaks you down. What if you have that anger, like, I'm sick of this. I'm fighting against this. I'm, you're not doing this anymore. I'm not having this anymore. It's that kind of anger. So if I replace the word hope, which is a religious word, uh, with belief. Yeah. The belief that this will change, that I can change this, along with proactivity. Yeah. Would that would would that be a better scenario? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and I've had that since I was a child, and I always thought it was a natural thing for me as a self defence, as uh, I want to survive kind of thing. It was wasn't something I thought; it was just something that happened. When I used to do this, um, when I used to go on walks sometimes to get away from the situation I was living in, I would have these scenarios in my head about how it could be. And that was a belief that one day it will be different. So we'll round off because it's your turn to make tea. <laughs> right. The, the, the person um, is in the fetal position. Yeah. And they've had enough. They've shut down completely. Uh, the aggressor, the instigator of the problem is, is out. And they're in this room. The darkened room, maybe on the bed or maybe on the settee or whatever, or even at a park bench. You see, often see people yeah. almost in fit positions on park benches. We've talked about what you do and how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it that simplistic? No, it's not. It takes an awful lot of, awful lot of will. It's so hard when you've got that darkness there and you're in that place. It is so hard to see a way out of it. And there's two things have always come in for me. And I think it's because there was suicide in the family. And I remember the fight to try and keep that person alive. Because I could see, um, and it was my mum and where she was going. And I remember that fear. I remember the frustration. I remember thinking, I'm losing this battle. And then she lost that battle. And I totally understood why. but. I, I, I just couldn't get my head around that, so I know what it feels like to face that. I know what it feels like, and I know what could happen if I don't fight. If I if if I lose that battle, I know what's going to happen. So that fear, in some ways, keeps me safe because I don't want to face that. You know, that is quite the thing to go to. Um, and then this is the hang anger. Right, I am not going to let this beat me. This is my life and I'm going to fight for it. And that's, that's, 
an instinct to survive, and I think everybody has that instinct to survive. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I, I believe that it's it's kind of been well proven in yeah, and using that, which, yeah, yeah, use it, you know, that instinct to survive, use it, good or bad, of it, use that force because that will keep you. Well, it's kept me away from the brink, um, and you know. When you see somebody go to the brink and 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 then go beyond and, and they've lost that will, it's a scary thing to see. I think it's pretty scary to see that. Um, so yeah, yeah, I see me sit on my hands, sit on my hands, so I didn't do anything stupid, and 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 fight that fight inside me, and. It's unbelievable to think that you've actually been there, but you know, you've got to fight it. You've got to, inside, I know I've got to fight it. And I've sat on my hands so that I won't get up and go and do something stupid that would end my life. And I've actually been in that place. Do, do you think people are frightened to talk about what some would see as weakness? Um, it, it's, it, it's a subject that people scurry around, they, they avoid at all costs, even when someone uh, sadly takes their own life, um, there's never any closure really no, at the isn't. end of it, but people don't treat it with the same sense of loss that, that obviously you did in, in your situation, but people don't see it as real loss, it's just someone who's taken their own life. Do you think people don't talk about it enough, they don't talk about that depth they can get to? No, I think it's because of the shame. I mean, a lot of years, I mean, what I did when my mum died, um, I got all the documentations and everything you could get around, stuff like that, there was an inquest. I took that information, I stuffed it in a, in a, a, a box and I hid it for years because I couldn't look at it. I just couldn't even think about it. I, I kind of thought, I can't cope with that. I mean, did that really happen? Did I really endure that? And did that really happen to me and, and to her? And and part of me couldn't cope with the fact I hadn't been able to stop it either. And it's massive loss. It's You know, it's a huge scar, a massive thing to happen to anybody in their life. And no, people don't talk about that. Why do, you know, it's just too difficult, isn't it? Nobody wants to get into it with you. And nobody wants to talk about it because it's almost like a taboo subject. Yeah, I mean, t two things, two terms you mentioned there that should never be attached in any way, shape or form to an individual's disparity, the, the despair at life and how they're coping or not coping with life. Uh, one was shame. Mm. Yeah. And what was the other one? Do you remember? Um, shame and guilt, you know, and... Taboo. Weakness. Weakness. Taboo. I mean, people walked across the street and wouldn't speak to me because they didn't want to talk to me about what had happened. And I didn't know how to speak about it. It was, And for years I said it was a cancer, but actually it wasn't. It, even the family wouldn't speak about it. It was just awful. And it took me a lot of years to get my head around that um, because I always felt because I've always had this belief of getting through and fighting through, I, f I could have found a way and I didn't. And, th and that was a massive learning curve for me because when somebody close to you does that, you know just how fragile life is and how much you've got to be aware of that. Because if, if you take your eye off the ball and you're living a shitty life, it'll catch you. Someone once said many years ago, and I know we're slightly diversified, we're still in the trauma uh, area, that to take your own life requires a tremendous amount of strength. Yeah. Now, you have to be at your lowest point mm. to do it. What a contradiction. Yeah. You're at your lowest point, you know you can't take any more. You're going to do something that, that, that very few people, you said to someone now, okay, you know, uh, could you take your own life if things got really bad? And most people say, oh, well, you know, the edge of it, it's the hardest thing ever to do. And yet the people that do it, sadly, and there's many, many more than people actually know, who 
at the weakest point, have done something that nobody else could probably do? I think it's because the fear is gone. For me, if you're not frightened of dying, because you don't think there's anything left worth living for, you've lost that fear of dying. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's nothing left to live for. And that's, that's why fear has always kept me... That's why I say fear kept me safe. As long as I'm frightened of that, my anger will come in and I'll fight. If I ever lost that fear, nah, I've lost that fight. It comes hand in hand and it sounds like a strange thing, but that fear can fuel your anger. Is it also quite sad as well that people, and we're not just talking about your mum, um, actually judge an act like that? Yeah, I think that's why a lot of people avoided me after my mum died, because they obviously judged what had happened. Um, and uh, selfish, yeah. didn't care about anybody else. For, um, I mean, I must be honest, I didn't judge my mum for that, but I did feel like, why, why was I not enough? I wondered that question, because you do as a child with a parent, and I'm sure the other way around as well, why was I not enough for my mum to live? And it wasn't until I started to reflect on her life that I realised why. I couldn't have asked her to live the life she was living. It wasn't me to say, was it? I mean, you can't ask anybody to live a shitty life. Quality of life is important. Oh, very, very important. Yeah. And if you don't have a quality of life, nobody has a right to say you live it. Absolutely. And no nobody uh, could have got inside your, your mum's head to, you know, to change things, to, to see what was going on, because she quite clearly had reached a point where yeah. she'd had enough. You know, this is a beautiful woman, you know, obviously very articulate, that reached a point that was so low that the people had the audacity to actually judge it, have an opinion, yeah. you know, feel shame by it, you know, uh, expect you to, to feel guilt, yeah. your mum to feel guilt in the next world, you know. It doesn't work that way. No. You know, and, and I think, although it's not what we're talking about, uh, when people struggle with trauma, and I mentioned about um, Foxy earlier, you don't know how close to the edge you get. Mm, no, you don't. You get very, very close. Yeah, I've, I've been, I mean, I've been asked that in counselling if I ever think about taking my own life and harm myself, and I always say no, because, um, because of the many fights I've had, and the many times I have hit that place and I've got myself out of it, to me, no. I have a safety thing that goes on inside of me, me, me fear and then the anger and I get myself out of it. So no, if you stay there, that's different. Yeah, I mean, you, you touched on, and we will round off now because it's 20 past, uh, you touched on quality of life. Now, this isn't about your mum, it's about many other things as yeah, well. it's but about anybody really, I think. If life has no quality and there is no hope and you don't need hope, you don't want will, you've had enough, you've reached the, the end. Is it something that people should judge? No, no. Um, there'll be plenty of times when people are in physical or emotional pain, it's so unbearable that why should they have to live with it? And that's not saying that, you know, that's not being awful or anything. It's, it's not fair that they have to live with that and yet they're expected to. You know, we, people with terminal illnesses where they're in chronic amount of pain and yet they're expected to just keep on chugging along. And yet we keep dogs and cats and, and you know, the dog isn't well and it's, it's obviously... We don't enough. do that for animals, no. We, 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 we show a kindness towards animals in that way that we don't to human we don't beings. Show, yeah, exactly. Um, and I think, just, just to finish off now, if I said to you that uh, trauma and the many emotions that it evokes, not yeah. just anger but deep, deep sadness, um, would you say that um, those feelings, those emotions uh, that people have with trauma, whether it be called PTSD or whatever, could lead to, without action and support, to an inevitable closure such as suicide? Yes. Definitely, because that's what happened to my mum and I'm sure it's happened to lots and lots of other people. Oh, definitely. And considering how dark my places have been, if, 
over the times in my life, I've had to fight out of absolutely. So a toolbox is essential, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to come back to this, this folks. The reason why we, we went to a slightly darker place is because we discussed prior to this that we don't want people thinking that this is one of these quick fix things where you no. buy your book and you know you you float over the the, the 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 earth in your balloon and you know you lie in the, the corridor and you put the key in the box and the lights coming through the window no you go to dark places but you always got to look for the light and that was the message we, we wanted to get across in this is that however dark things get always look for that light yes because it is right. worth it it is and if we can keep some people like your mum, away from that even darker place where they actually choose to take their own life, then, you know, that, that's a yes, massive plus, isn't it? It is, definitely. Um, I hope, and I hope that anybody re listening to these podcasts that we do can find some hope, because, you know, that's all what it's about, isn't it? That future you might be able to get to, that belief that can be different. Absolutely, yeah. And it's, it's a big subject, and we're going to come back to it. Just before we finish... Um, I used to cycle the, the Dissington uh, cycle work quite a lot when I uh, was at work and also sometimes I popped down to meetings and things in Workington. And on the steel bridge in Dissington, anybody listening to, to, to this now, you've probably passed it yourself on a walk or whatever. It's been there for years, as long as I remember when my kids were small. And somebody had uh, painted on the bridge that there is no hope without dope. <laughs> so I'm not promoting you smoking marijuana, but always keep that that hope. <laughs> <laughs> and is any words you want to say before you finish? No, not until next time. Thank you. That's a wrap. Okay.